There we go. There we go. Hello, everyone. Um, we may have a slight audio issue. How guys? How are you doing? Hey, hey. What's up? Oh, hello. Good, but I had to switch over something. One second. I can't hear them. I can't hear them. There we go. Uh, no, that's weird. Hold on, everyone. It's Saturday. There's an audio issue. Um, that's interesting. We want it wouldn't be Saturday without, without, without I can't a hear that. glitch of some sort. Uh, why can't I hear that? I think I need to switch this over. I do! That should work. Um, okay, I think we're good to go. Apologies. Um, I have a new setup here, a new monitor, and of course, every time there's a new monitor, your system has to assume that the new monitor is your speaker system. So everything gets defaulted to the monitor as your speaker's even though those aren't my speakers. So, um, I had this problem at work, but that's okay. We're all good to go. And, um, yep, goes the machine, exactly. So, hello all, we are here to talk about Princess Mononoke, Hayao Miyazaki's um, 1997, I believe, anime film, um, which is quite a movie. We will have a lot to talk about tonight. Um, and um, first off, just kind of, um, what are your all's experiences with Princess Mononoke up to this point in your lives? Ah. <laughs> It is, it is definitely, definitely longer. Um, sorry, we're having another audio issue. Um, the computer decided to have an issue. That's weird. It was okay for like three seconds, then it suddenly kicked out. Um, why isn't it? One moment, please. Again. Um, well, let's try that. Will that work? I don't, yep, oh, that might work. All right. Uh, can you guys please talk? Hello, my baby. Hello, okay. my sweetie. There we Hello, go. Hello, my ragtime gal. That Hello, works. Hello, darling. Hello, my ragtime gal. That's weird. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Kiss by wire. You are yeah. my heart's desire. Come with fire. Yeah, okay. If you refuse me, darling, <laughs> yeah, we do show to you. We well. Well. Oh, All right. So, um... <laughs> now that the song and dance is out of the way... Steve, what is your experience with this Princess Mononoke? Let's, let's do that again. Redo. Um, I will just, just recap that uh, the first time that I had watched it, I was uh, drinking malt liquor, so I didn't re remember much of it. Mm. Second time I watched it, which was this time around, um, remembered you know the bits and pieces I remember of it. But I enjoyed watching it. And uh, I know I'm gonna have to watch it again a couple more times because there's a lot. There's a lot to this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to the point where like I just gave up on trying to this because after a while I was just like going, I'm not gonna remember anything. So I'm just gonna <laughs> keep watching this yeah. over and over and over again. But it is an enjoyable one. Like I said, it would surprise me because we've been watching movies that were between eighty and ninety minutes long usually. So when this one popped up at was it two hours and, and fifteen? Something like that, yeah. Like, uh, ten. Oh, it's a it's yeah. it's a it's a movie. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so, Miyazaki had the yeah, bucks. It's, it's, yeah. And apparently so, the well, time. Who, how long did this take to produce? Ooh, years. Yeah. Yeah. JJ, how about you? Uh, jeez. I think I saw it when some of the first Miyazaki stuff showed up in theaters. Mm -hmm. Eon, like, nice. Eon, you know. Wow. Um, so it was, you know, pretty impressive. Yeah. And then this time around, it was an opportunity to sit down and, like, pay attention to a lot of what was happening, to stop being, you know, 
gobsmacked with it, going, oh, "Wow!" <laughs> yeah. Sort of like when we rewatched, a, you know, we're watching Akira and stuff like that. We watched mm-hmm. a number of times where you're like, you stop being wowed by it, and then you can start being critical of it with it. Exactly. Um, thus, thus, basically ruining the entertainment. Value. <laughs> hey, hey. Yeah, I've seen it a few times, um, quite a few times at this point. Um, I chose to say I've uh, watched some of Toshio Okada, the Ota Kings analysis of it, so I'll be bringing some of that as well, because uh, there's a lot to unpack in Princess Mononoke. Um, this film was um, Miyazaki kind of challenging himself. Um, he felt that Nausicaa was a film that he made sort of when he was trying to do something big, but that didn't really achieve what he was trying to achieve um, artistically, and he wanted to make something that was more complex, um, something that was... Um, um, incorporating a lot of what he learned as a filmmaker um, since. Moreover, by this point, he had kind of taken on Isao Takahata's idea of not like communicating everything to the audience. Um, this is really a turning point in Miyazaki, I think, where up until this point, um, the motivations of all the characters in Miyazaki's movies are very clearly laid out to you. They'll even say under their breath things about you know what they're trying to do, etc. Um... Mononoke is where that starts becoming less clear, where Miyazaki clearly plans things, has things going on behind the scenes, but he never communicates that specifically to the audience, um, and you're kind of left to figure it out and kind of fill in the details yourself. Um, Starting with this image here that I'm showing, which is the title sequence from the movie, uh, which is itself kind of complicated because this was not the title Hayao Miyazaki wanted for his movie. This was not his plan. Toshio Suzuki did not like the original title. He wanted to title it Princess Mononoke, whereas Hayao Miyazaki's title was The Legend of Ashitaka. Hmm. Because this is Ashitaka's story, really, and he felt that Princess Mononoke is is. exactly a romance movie. Um, But apparently, Toshio Suzuki disagreed. They argued, and then when they went to announce the movie... Toshio Suzuki just said, and I'm here to announce the next movie, Princess Mononoke! (laughs) And just preempted Hayao Miyazaki and just (laughs) announced that to the world. And so that had to be the title. Um, So, yeah. But also importantly, this image. I know it's hard to see here. um, And actually, I can probably expand that a little bit. I'm just going to fill our faces here for a second with this image, um, which you see is the title and it's got this stuff behind it. And it's obviously like pottery of some kind, right? Um, and it has this design on it. Can you guys tell what that design is of? Because I had to have a Okada point this out to me. It's clearly sort of a vaguely humanoid figure. There's a head, and then there's something else going out from it. Um, is it a phoenix or something? Looks kind of like it. Um, it's actually kind of reminiscent of the, um, the angel in Nausicaa. Right? Um, okay. That thing. And obviously this is kind of reminiscent of that. But more specifically, I think what this is, this is the great forest spirit when all the tentacles are coming out from them. Oh. Right? Okay. Rendered in pottery. And here's what's important about that. In Jumon pottery. Yes! Exactly. This is Jomon pottery. Which is the really? pottery... Yes. Um, this is the style of Jomon pottery. <laughs> which is the pottery of Ashitaka's village. Oh. Right. Which means they find out what happens to Ashitaka. Right? The story ah. does make it back to them. And that is something kind of in the movie that gets kind of dealt with over the course of the movie. Um, and the movie very much starts with this whole thing um, <coughs> of just introducing the forest, right? And, and, introduce- and I should also point out the first tree that we see destroyed in this movie is destroyed by the boar god, right? It's not destroyed by a human, it's, it's initially that. Um, and then we get, oh my gosh, Ashitaka on Yakul. Um, yeah. And this just gorgeous opening with the, uh, the forests and the, and we talked before about how um, a lot of times when animators are making something, they're kind of showing off. Um, you know, if you have the budget, you show that off. And all the dappled color of the light coming through the trees. This is them saying, we have a budget and we're using it. Gosh, it's gorgeous. Which I looked when I, when I watched this again, I'm Mm. like, okay, when he's on Yakul, I'm I'm like, you know, hmm, I wonder, 
I'm like, dude, did, did like the Ainu ride, or did anybody who ah. was you know, original inhabitants ride deer? And I'm looking this up. I'm like, no, I found a Buddhist tale mm -hmm. of uh, Buddha being reborn as a mm -hmm. deer. Right. And um, it's the story of the of the Ruru deer or the golden deer or mm -hmm. the deer of nine colors. Okay. Yep. Um, and we'll get to that. And they're known deer are also known in Shinto as being messengers of the gods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. So I'm like, I'm looking this up. I'm like, this is stuff I never had a clue about. Exactly. <laughs> and that's, that's it. Well, and the reason for this, right. the reason he rides a red elk is because <clears throat> Hayao Miyazaki actually had a problem visually in the movie. Um, Ashitaka is from the Imishi people, which are meant to be a um, um, one of the the original tribes in Japan that were driven out by the ethnically Japanese people as we know them today. Um, if he rode a horse, because he needed to be able to move around in the story, yep. his Japanese audience would immediately code him as a samurai and he would seem like them. And so he needed to give him a very different mount, a kind of fantastical mount, to dis divorce the audience from, remember, from thinking of him as being right. ethnically Japanese. Um, but, but yeah. The, fantastic, fantastical, but not mythical. Exactly, Necessarily. Yes. And not, so grounded in, right, like, you yeah. could ride a deer. Exactly. An yeah, elk not unrealistic. An animal. Right. right. Mm -hmm, so absolutely. it's not like some magical Pegasus kind of creature. Exactly. Around, so. And it's one of the important things about this movie is that this is set in a specific historical period in Japanese history. Like, this is not just some made-up fantastical, you know, fantasy medieval time in, in Japan. Like, these are carefully researched peoples and, and places and so forth. Uh, down to the point where, like, when they revealed where the... Um, um, where they based the, the region of Iron Town in, folks were like, oh, that makes sense, because the emperor was in Kyoto here, right? right. And all the little things all kind of fit together. Um, well, I also think it's interesting that hit the people in his village, mm. the hats that the girls are wearing yeah. when they meet him, that yeah. is a... It, 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 I understand the, 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 the Anishi people carry on, but that's also a traditional... Korean styled mm. headpiece. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And his yeah. sword with the ring yeah. on it yeah. is also a Chinese very styled Korean. sword. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like, it's very interesting to see the sort of immigration pattern kind of mm -hmm. notion that the Anishi mm -hmm. would have sort of made homegrown over centuries, right. but that the or origin pieces where they, where they gravitated from mm -hmm. through China down through Korea. Yep. And and you'll notice they're you know they're basically wielding machetes, not like, yeah. you know, swords in the right. combat sense. Right. Um, more like Bronze Age weaponry as opposed to which we, as we well know, swords are elongated knives. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. you get that right. technology as it stretches with the material capabilities mm -hmm. totally. to end up as a sword. Yep. Um, uh, whereupon we get the boar god. Um, and the board god comes <laughs> and in. Now board god. <laughs> and now board god. And now god. And should we point out, again, we, we talk about this, about, you know, um, how much Miyazaki has changed. We get an action scene three minutes into this movie. Yeah. Right? With this very clearly delineated, you know, here are our good guys, here, here's our villain, this needs to be resolved. Um, and boy, is that board god a thing. Um, N Nagao. Nagao. Oh it was the original, yeah. So, and yeah. The, so this boar god is based on a traditional Japanese myth of a boar that was hunted and then was not disposed of properly, uh, and so his spirit then went around and haunted various um, um, uh, highways and byways, basically, and killed travelers until someone finally took him down. This sort of uh, evil boar spirit, um, which is kind of a repurposing of that myth, um, and. And in this combat, it's interesting seeing, again, how much Miyazaki is communicating here with things like when the boar god hits the, um, uh, you know, the watchtower, the watchtower collapses. Watch yeah. You know, um, these are all realistic things that are happening. Yakul freaks out. Uh, you know, he just does not know what to do in the situation. And, and uh, Ashitaka has to fire that arrow to, like, get him out of his, 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 yeah. his problem. Um um, and then you have the, the fight with the boar god. Um, something that I noticed this time is that, uh, which I, I just love, is that when, uh, the, when the, the girl trips um, and, and the boar god, also you note, the boar god um, comes out into the light 
Yeah. And that's when he notices the girls. Um, right. The girl trips. Um, they come after her, uh, her. Kai is not the girl who trips. Kai is the girl who stops with the sword to defend her friend. And that's what Kazaza tries to go, Kaya, no, and do the thing. Gee, incidentally, that's the blade. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. it's a Chinese style called a Dao. Dao. Or a okay. Da Dao. Okay. And cool. it's one for one. I mean, I looked mm. the blade up. <laughs> it is an exact copy <laughs> of a Chinese Dao. Yep, exactly. Um, All the way down to the ring on the rear mm-hmm. end. So that's yeah. it. Yeah. This oh, is... Miyazaki. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thinks these things through. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and so um, Ashitaka does the thing. You know, as defender of the village, he defends the village, um, but is cursed with the boar, uh, uh, or the boar god's um, uh, curse. And we get some, some very interesting um, stuff out of this. The wise woman comes and says, um, we will erect a, um, a tomb here. For you, we will do all the right things spiritually so that you will rest. Please don't do anything further. Whereupon the boar god, very creepily, um, responds um, and says, "No, I will curse you forever." Note, that's not true. No god in Princess Mononoke has any power after death. Right? Those are empty words. Right. He is just speaking out of rage. Um, um, and so then you have the, the wonderfully disgusting destruction of the Boar God. And again, I think this is Miyazaki talking to the audience saying, this is not Kiki's delivery service. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know yes, I'm, welcome to your nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You setting a bar here. Um, and the fact that this is very unnatural, right? This isn't just some supernatural thing happening. Yeah. This is something yeah. like really bad. Um, and so then we get, we go to, go ahead. No, what I was going to say was, <clears throat> so when the elder woman of the village, yeah. you know, when they go into the next scene, uh, yeah. her, into her cliff dwelling or, or, or temple or whatever mm. it was, um, a very shamanistic, uh, yes. stuff going on there. Casting and, stones and, and bones. It is bones and stuff like that. And one of the things that, that weirded me out. A little mm. bit between that and the actual forest spirit mm. was the the fact that they were s- bo- both smiling at weird times. Yes, and we'll get to that. You know, mm-hmm. okay, because that that thoroughly confused me when she's like basically telling, yep. I should gotta, you know, hey, we're sending you out forever. You're gonna die a horrible death, and there you go. You know, and she smiling, yep. got the Have fun. smile. Bye-bye. So this is something that Okada explains, um, uh, which you get to hear in a second. Um, it should be a few things to point out uh, first. Um, uh, you'll notice that Jomon style pottery in the, the situation that the, all those, those wonderful curves um, in that. So again, we're establishing this is these people. That's what's going on. Um, um, and then you also see, and I'll see if I can, I can find the shot uh, where you can see in here, whole, the whole one side of this room is a rock. Yep. It's a giant stone that has an altar in front of it. What this means is that these, these are people that worship nature. Um, they don't worship people, and this is a Jomon people, uh, thing. They don't, right. they don't worship people, they don't worship gods per se, they worship nature as a, a spiritual force. Um, and so here's also where we get some of the backstory, right? That these people were exiled by the emperor and they are off in you know, nowhere. Um, and their bloodline is sort of thinning over the course of time. Whereupon the wise woman kind of lies to Ashitaka because she tells him you have this thing that will eat you up inside and kill you. She doesn't mention that he's turning into a god, that he is getting all of these powers, right? That he's going to become this thing. Instead, she says, you have this sickness, but you know what? You can get a cure. You know what you should do now that you're turning into a tactical nuclear weapon? You should go to the West where that emperor that kicked us out lives. 
You should go there and kick around looking for a cure for a while. That's Take a good idea. Take disease over there. Exactly. Over there. You know? And so I think this is what Okada says is she is basically – and this, uh, uh, there, there's a Jomon people thing. A curse should be um, replied to with a curse. She is recursing the emperor for cursing them with Ashitaka's curse. The men don't see it. Ashitaka doesn't realize it. But she's going, ha ha, emperor, here you go. We finally get our revenge, <laughs> right? I think that's what's going on in that scene. Um, yeah, sorry, Ashitaka, that you've got, you know, this, this issue, but go run wild over there. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, <laughs> A lot of love uh, in that moment. Totally. Run amok. Mm-hmm. Run amok. Um, and it should also be noticed, um, you know, again, in that scene, we get very deliberately um, placed here Ashitaka's arm on top of the pottery. Yep. Because these two things are related, right? We, we, are, we are seeing these, these two things. Essentially, he, he is not just cursed, he also has a spiritual power now. Um, although that spiritual power has its issues as well. Well, it's also very interesting, too, that his curse bears a striking resemblance to leprosy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which we do see later in the film. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, so when I, th- I thought about that, I'm like, hmm. Yeah. That's a curse. That's actually, yeah. you know, leprosy is a curse. Mm-hmm. And people you know, respond to it in a similar fashion. So it's mm-hmm. like, huh. Okay. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Exactly. Um, um, so Ashitaka is, is sent from his village. Um, he uh, cuts his, his, uh, um, top knot off um, and you'll notice we get this shot of the knife this knife is probably the only steel in the village um, what they're showing off here is that this is a you know they actually have finely crafted knives right right um, their the dows are much more utilitarian mm-hmm. yeah. this is a specifically well crafted right. single piece mm-hmm. because he's a prince and he can yep. afford things like that uh, which is also important for the next scene um, when he leaves the village, Kaya comes to see him. Um, a lot of female fans are really pissed off at this scene. Um, because, especially in, in fact, in, in the official, like, one of the official books about Hrithis Nanoke, there's an article by a female author who rants about this element of the movie, of the fact that, um, uh, Ashitaka meets with Kaya. It should be pointed out, he calls her little sister, that is a term of endearment. It is not meant to indicate siblings. Right. It is, you know. Um, she is younger than he. Right. And so, um, um, then he gives her this handsome smile, says, I'll remember you forever, and then rides off into the dawn and this, with this triumphant music <laughs> and leaves her and gives her dagger to some other woman and yeah. just, you know, <laughs> I, abandons I her and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, and what Miyazaki has later said is and and some of this is also coming to a bunch of different um to a bunch of other different pieces here's the thing um ashitaka is at one of the lowest points in, in his life right now right kaya however is freaking out so what ashitaka is doing is he is putting on a brave face for her right also he does he is a prince a girl of the village does not rush out to meet the prince unless they know each other really well. And they know each other really well. Which leads us to a question. By marriage promise or by young folks in love? Young folks in love. Because um, here's the thing. Um, and in this sort of culture, that's what you did, right? You got very physical very quickly. Because um, why doesn't she ask, why doesn't she say the thing that is in every, um, um, it would be the, the classic romantic response, take me with you, right? Why doesn't she say, I will go with you? It's because she has to stay behind to give birth to Ashitaka's child. I was just about to say, you're going there, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think that's the implication. <laughs> what? You know? Um, because that is, again, a thing a prince can do. It should also be pointed out, he never says, the two of us only will be together forever. Princes and kings at the time had more than one wife. They had concubines. 
they had plenty of women involved in their lives. Well, the three girls alone that he's trying to protect from the Mm Borgon, it's like, if you're going to go so far as to say that she's (laughs) the one that's pregnant, you don't even know if the other two just haven't gotten pregnant yet. Exactly. Um, And this is the the thing, is that Ashitaka's uh behavior all throughout the movie is not monogamous. Right? He's not thinking that way. This is a, a, a woman he loves. He clearly cares very deeply for. San is also a woman that he comes to care for. Those are not mutually exclusive for Ashitaka. Right. Different culture. Right. Um, it's just seen very differently. He and shows it, much more affection to Jarul than he does to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and in fact, uh, Miyazaki has said he actually went to, to the background artist and to Joho Seishi about this scene and begged them for the most beautiful background they could paint and the most beautiful piece of music for this moment because he said, I have put Ashitaka through so much hell in this movie, he is feeling so badly, I want to give him a heroic moment. I want to give him one moment where, he, you know, everything looks awesome. So this is kind of Miyazaki's weird redemption for, for Ashitaka, <laughs> to give him kind of a big moment when he is feeling, the swell of the music is not to, to mean everything is great, it means the, the, the emotion is swelling up in him. He's feeling right. everything right now. Um... So yeah, there's a lot going on in that. Um, well, his inheritance is basically thrown out the door. Yeah. Well, he's right. going out into the world not as, you know, Prince Ashitaka. He's going out into the world as a guy riding a deer. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> yep. he is the ultimate outsider to any community that he's going to go into. Mm-hmm. And in those days, if you didn't have the right, you know, passes from the authority yeah. that be passed through territories. Right. Mm-hmm. You uh, got uh, kind of in a lot of trouble real quick. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, and very early on, you see what? You see this village being attacked. Um, it should be pointed out, classically at this time in history, um, a lot of villages would be at war with each other. You ever seen some of the samurai? Um, you know the kind of time it is. The fact that these samurai are attacking this village does not mean the village is guiltless. Right? There could be any number of feuds right. going on. This could be a retaliation or something else they did. Um, so this is not meant to, to be purely, oh, poor people under attack. This is one of the billions of battles being fought at any given right. time in the, in, in the, uh, um, in the country. And, and it's very interesting how he doesn't, um, he tries to not involve yeah himself to it absolutely like he actively tries to he sees the battle and he goes okay let's skirt this yep. you know, yeah he doesn't know which side to fight on because you know like you say is the village guiltless maybe maybe not or well, the samurai he, he doesn't have a dog bandits? in this he fight though you know what I mean? It's like right, he's got exactly. no reason to pick a side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like he just and, needs and he a road to go down to the west. That's all he right. needs. <laughs> and that's a, and, and when east, he right. is it, when he is confronted, he's just like he again. He goes, "I please don't. Yep. Let's not do this. Let's not. I, I'm you, you do what you do. I'm going to do what I'm going to do." Mm-hmm. And then you get a display of his powers, which really should not have shocked me, <laughs> but it did. Yeah. And we, after seeing the Borgod, God, the, 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 the first Borgod, God, the, you know, mm-hmm. the Nightmare, the, the tentacles and all that crap. Yeah. Um, but as as he, you know, loses, this is where he's also coming into realizing that like, like he has powers with this curse. Mm-hmm. And just the damage that that one little arrow oh, does. Yeah. <laughs> with a samurai. And yep. you're like, the arm just flies off. And it's not just like, ah, my arm. It's like it flies off into the air. You can't watch it. And it's like, you're just like, you know, like Miyazaki is going, put the kids to bed. Okay? Yeah. Because that's what this is about, right? Exactly. You know? And, you know, and limbs are getting off and people slowly falling off the yeah. horse dead and surprised. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like sitting there just going, it's a freaking arrow, not yeah. an ant. And exactly. Come on, what, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. But well, I mean, he effectively disarmed the guy, you know, <laughs> burning it, and it, and and you know mm-hmm. the other dude lost his head in combat, you know. Yes. But uh, mm-hmm. it's it's and I like the fact that you're not yeah. none of it's explained, <laughs> right? You know, you know that Ashtaka is <clears throat> cursed, 
But that doesn't tell you anything. It just says mm -hmm. he's cursed. Oh, he's going to die. The elder of the village, he's mm -hmm. going to die. And yet you watch this and you're like, I'm pretty sure that he couldn't do that normally. I'm pretty sure right. that's unusual. Exactly. <laughs> and it's uh -huh. like, it's, it takes to, you know, sort of back it up a little bit to be like, what would make him different uh -huh. from right. trying to shoot the mm -hmm. boar god to now? Yep. It has to be the curse. Mm -hmm. But exactly. none of that said. Yep. If you don't put the two and two together, it's like, oh, he must have just been magical before, and now he's just extra magical. Yeah. Like, well, because that's the thing. Like, he reacts to this. <laughs> you know, he just, wait, yeah. what? Like, that's not supposed to happen. Right. Um, I also love that you see, like, like, they animate in that wonderful shot of the arrow kind of doing this as it's flying past. You know, it's kind of seeking its target. Yeah. <laughs> Where it's like, oh, that's creepy. Um... Uh, guided guided arrows. Wow, yeah. the technology at the time. It's amazing. Exactly. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and so I should go to the first village where we meet Jigo for the first time. Um, uh, and we, we meet our mysterious monk, um, who is such an interesting character in this film. Um, because... Mole. Mm -hmm. Mole. Did, did, did you guys watch the uh, Japanese... Or, or the uh, or the or the English version. I, I watched mo both, but I listened to the English dub for this one. Ah, well, so I when I heard Japanese. the voice, I watched the English version, and and I heard the voice. I'm like, Billy Bob, is that you? <laughs> yeah, it's Billy Bob Ford. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like really? Yep. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel yeah. like yeah. I might have missed something. Now. Um, I love this English dub. It was very carefully crafted. Um, there are great things about the English, about the Japanese dub that I, but there are elements of that dub that just don't work as, as well for me. Um, uh, so one of those, you know, six, one and a half dozen, the other things. Um, but yeah. Um, um, and so, yeah. And so you, you get this, this, this sequence, which you won't go into too much detail with, which is about finding out a bit more about the background, what's going on sort of politically in the world. Um, and it's important for, it's basically a pointer scene. We talked about that before, right? You need the scene, yeah. which explains what's going on. This is the scene. Um, but we get very much, and again, this is one of those things where Miyazaki is kind of playing with his audience, where if you've ever watched a Miyazaki movie, you know not to trust this guy, right? <laughs> like, his character design is very much this, he's, he, you know, the untrustworthy thing, but he does nothing untrustworthy in the scene. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, except for, mm -hmm. except for, mm -hmm. he says, you should eat up, this is your rice. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ash is point. just sitting back, and he's got yep. his bowl, and he's not doing much of anything. And Milo's just sitting there, just shoveling it down. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, so you're not, like, going to kill him in his sleep. Right. But you are basically just taking away from him all this rice that he bought. Mm, like, okay. Yeah. Uh, yep. That's a cheap, exactly. Um, tells you something. Um, um, we also know, if we watched the movie before... Uh, we watched, yeah, we watched the movie before. That what's happening here is that you know Jigo is just going on about his business. He has all these big plans going on, and he finds someone with power. And he says, "You know where you should go. You should go over there. That place where I have interests, and you can you you know you're looking for the forest spirit. Go for it. You know you want to you want to have a conversation with the forest spirit." Great, because you might take care of my problem for me. <laughs> um, and so then we meet for the first time, um, so our, our main characters. Um, we get to meet Lady Boshi. Um, we get to meet the caravan going through. Um, and we get one of our first uh, sort of signals of, what the, of who these people are by the fact that they are ox drivers. Ox drivers were low class, right? They were one of the unmentionables of Japanese society. So the fact that Lady Eboshi is associating with them says something about her character and also the kinds of things she has to do as a person. Um, and this is where, of course, we meet the wolves for the first time. Um, and as you said, no explanation, no information about what's going on. These are clearly not, you know, um, puppies. <laughs> <laughs> these, are, these are big, um, but they, they well, attack. The therapy dogs are here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. no. Unless your therapy is being chewed apart. Yeah. Um, and here we see those, those guns. And again, they never explain it, but we see that these are Chinese guns. Yeah. 
Um, Miyazaki never said this to anybody, but in the documentaries, um, you see a bunch of his notes, and he said that Lady Boshi um, was with Chinese pirates uh, originally. And, uh, well, not, not necessarily Chinese pirates, but pirates in, like, the China Sea. Um, and she made her way to Japan, and she brought Chinese gunpowder technology with her to Japan. Um, and this is very much, and I, John, uh, you're talking about this. These are, this is very much... Yeah, the Heilong Zhang. Ah, okay. Um, and at one point, I mean, you, you do see when sort of looking at it, you'll mm -hmm. see, a, and I think in this, you could just barely see yeah. there's a dragon mm -hmm. symbol on the side of that. Yep. And it's mm -hmm. like, so that, that's kind of the nod, nod, you know, nudge, nudge kind of thing. Like, Hey, look, see, it's a Chinese mm -hmm. uh, hand cannon, basically. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Um, and hand so, cannon is very much the so, term. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that's what it was. Um, but but the, one of the things about you know, about having the hand cannon and um, the, having those weapons, and then later on you see that you, they have a match lock that she mm -hmm. wields yeah. a match lock, mm -hmm. and and that um, but they're calling them rifles, by the way, folks. That's, that's not a correct yeah. term. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we don't see we don't see right. what the manufacturing process is i mean yeah. well that's what i was going to say rifled, but i i'm not sure to what degree right no, concepts were understood at that time mm -hmm. no Versus well I, I can I, I can tell you it was, it's a smooth board. It's, it's based on the portuguese are um mm -hmm. are big place and um, wheel locks and match yeah, locks yeah well that's what that was the tanagashima match lock um mm -hmm. not that what they were showing me there that was something a model completely different um make right. mm -hmm. but, it, but it was a match lock but but at the time in in Japan, that while gunpowder was not a thing per se that the Japanese had, um, it was a Chinese import, Korean import that was coming in, and the Chinese you know, of course weaponized it. So that's where those initial hand cannons that, that you see, mm -hmm. um, the, the the regular troops using. Even just the house is an expensive thing. The the powder mm -hmm. for those are is expensive because because it's not made in Japan. Like they actually had to yeah. actually buy, buy it already manufactured. And so for the Tanagashima, um, or not, it's not a Tanagashima, but for the Matchlock, later on when you see the, the lepers, you know, working on the firearms, yeah. she either had, it within the movie, yeah. either had some type of template, because remember, they're, they're always improving on it so that they mm -hmm. can compare the, 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 the Matchlocks. Um, it was it, it it what that means is wealth. Mm -hmm. So, t in typical Japanese history, if you had a matchlock, whether it be a pistol or a, mm -hmm. you know, a musket, um, it meant you had money to be able to use it. Yeah. Um, it wasn't you know cannon were more actually more prevalent in Japanese use mm -hmm. of gunpowder than, than these arms were. Mm -hmm. But these were this was to denote that you had money and you had wealth and you had power, so you would, you know, of course, naturally use these. So this woman mm. is clearly a power, mm -hmm. exactly. And of, it should be of some sort. Of... And Steve, as you, as you as you mentioned before, often if some if a, if a lord open, owned a rifle, it was a an object of status, right? It's something they would bring yeah. out and show. Right. That is not how she's using these, right? You know, right. These are very much weapons of. Of not necessarily war, but of defense, um, and she owns a lot of them, and like yeah. she's getting her for people to use them. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, um, and so we get the fight with um, with Moro, um, um, and it just be pointed out. This is also one of the, the first moments when we discover that what's happening here is um, is fantastical, and I'm going to see if I can find the exact moment. I think this it's here because um, during this whole fight we see all this happen and we cut back uh, temporarily to Ashitaka who hears this happening in the distance and again, I'm not sure if I'll be able to find it here in in the the, the sequence um, but where he is it's not raining um, let me see if I can find it again this is yeah I'm not gonna be able to find it um, but when it cuts back to him hearing all these explosions all these banging going on there we go um, there's just some light drips of water here and there. Right. So space is different, right? We're in some place where you can hear something that's happening nearby, but, you know, 
the, the clouds and the rain are in a very different spot. So we're, these little su subtle hints that we're, we're starting moving into a more fantastical, fantastical land. Um, uh, and so Ashitaka finds the other uh, people. We have a little respite here. We've been getting a lot of plot, a lot of dr drama, um, a lot of dark stuff. That, you know, Moro coming at the, uh, the, the, the caravan is terrifying. <laughs> yeah. When she's just shoving people past. Um, um, and Which then... Is if, as if San riding mm. the other two wolves was yeah. a good indicator mm -hmm. of yeah. scale. Yeah, exactly. Moro is so freaking <laughs> huge. Right. She's huge. like twice the size of the oxen yeah. that she's just demolishing. Mm -hmm. She's a giant wolf god. Exactly, yeah. Um, this, this is definitely a, a huge thing. And again, it's one of the things that I, I appreciate about the movie is that you don't see that until she's attacking the caravan. Yeah. Uh, you just see this white wolf coming, and then all of a sudden you're like, it's that big? Holy smokes. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we should have expected it. Yeah. The boar god exactly. is freaking huge. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you gotta kind of expect once you reach a certain level, <laughs> you get giant. Mm -hmm. like, oh. And uh, Moro definitely is. Um, yeah. And so we get a moment of levity where, where uh, Ashaka is rescuing the, these men, uh, and they were kind of freaking out. Um, uh, but then he sees... Saw him for the first time. Um, and we get that moment. And again, this is where I think um, uh, Miyazaki is sort of thumbing his nose at the audience. Um, here's our female lead. And the first thing she does, our first view of her, is covered in blood, sucking blood out of a wound. Um, you know, yeah. this, this is kind of anti-moe right here going on. Yeah. Um, uh, and she just rejects him like, right. Yeah, that was a great scene where she just turns around and she's just like, just like blood smeared <laughs> yeah, all over the place. With, with, with that, with, 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 like, with, she wow. spits and she's got that look in her eye, just like, dude, just go. Yeah, just go. I, I, got, I, I have no time. For yeah, you. that spot. <laughs> that, that's a great capture, Brent. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> she doing dip? Oh no! <laughs> that was blood. Yeah, it's some thick Kool Aid there. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, and and again, you see, from my shock's perspective, he's like, ah, oh, clearly I have reached the land of the gods. It's time for me to say, hey, look, I'm I'm not your enemy. Can you help me? Um, to which they say no. Well, I like in this too. You ne you have no explanation why when San's doing this yeah. and Ashtaka is like in the area. Did you notice her her vestments go? Yes, her little earrings. Yeah. They, they're doing something mm -hmm. that's not wind driven. That's not yeah. accidental driven. Mm -hmm. They're responding somehow in some way, and mm -hmm. it's never mentioned how. Yeah, mm -hmm. not a word. Mm -hmm. It's like so we're, how, wolves don't make earrings. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. <laughs> what are those? Mm -hmm. Where would you get them? Yes, and that is something that we will find out about later in the movie because there's a hint dropped about that later on. Ah. Um. Uh, so yeah. So, so we move on. We get the Kodama for the first time, one of the classic anime spiritual characters. Um, little ghost characters, the Kodamas show up. Um, little spirits of the forest. Um, Honestly, the first time I saw this film, yeah. I was like, oh crap, <laughs> it's really going to happen now. Yeah. This whole thing, I mean, it's like some kind of evil skull creature and they're all going to die. <laughs> then it's like, okay, what happened? Oh good, well, well, oh, that's mean, good. <laughs> Okay, nothing bad's gonna happen, but they're creepy as hell because they're, oh. they're just like, you know, literally just like, I'm gonna. <laughs> and you're just like, you're just like going, why are you? Please stop, please stop. <laughs> and then hundreds of them appear, and they're like going, hey, we know you enjoy this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's over and over again, yep. and you're just like going, oh. oh. Yep. Exactly. If I was, um, if I was the guy with the broken arm on on, on the back of the uh, mm. beer, I'd, I'd probably be just like going. Yeah, I'd, I'd be freaking out too. Yeah, exactly. Like, little teeny tiny belts with their little clackety heads. And you're yep. Just like, yeah. No, no, please. Yeah, please no. Please, can I go back to sleep now? And they're yeah. slightly rotoscopy kind of look as they're running over oh, yeah, the do, do. Yeah. roots and mm -hmm. stuff, where it's kind of like, oof, that's just creepy. Does this <laughs> remind you of any other Hayao Miyazaki movie? Where characters are following a spiritual creature through the forest. Totoro. Going back to Nos Totoro. And Totoro. Okay. Yeah. I was say, we're I'm not really... going back as far as Nos. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are obviously parallels, but um, 
know, this is very much May following the, the, the little Totoro through the yeah. forest, right? Um, little little nutsack. Uh, exactly. And then, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it is very much that. To the point where they go into a giant tree, right? Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's clearly kind of mimicking that thing. And again, we'll get to more of that later on. Um, um, whereupon we get this scene, and this is where I fell in love with the movie. Um, like, I was blown away by it, but this is the, the, the moment where it just becomes sublime for me. When um, Ashitaka sees the great forest spirit for the first time. Um, in this beautiful um, glen um, out of nowhere. And again, Miyazaki not explaining anything. Yeah. Ma many other filmmakers, Ashitaka would be monologuing throughout the entire thing. He's like, well, this must be happening, this must be happening, what's going on? And he says a few lines, but it's very much just, okay, this is weird. Oh, there's a thing over there. Um, and we see the great forest spirit. And, and again, because of course, oh, and I should also point out, we have the longest pan in like animation history. <laughs> um, again, possibly uh, just beautiful forest. Yeah, beautiful scenery. showing off a little bit. Um, but again, I think a lot of other filmmakers. Oh, you have the great forest spirit. Great. No, you just saw it. That's it. Right. We we don't have a big confrontation scene. We don't get to move this forward. This is what most people's experience is like. Maybe right. someday at some point you glimpse it through the forest. That's it. Yeah, you don't have, like, the canopy open, a giant <laughs> ray of sunlight or a giant column of sunlight, and this thing walks into it. You go, oh, my. <laughs> it's like, no, nope, it's just sort of kind of incidental that it happens to be there. Yep. You see it? Mm -hmm. it goes. Exactly. Takes um, a look at you and goes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Also, did you notice all the other deer are male in this? They all have antlers going through that. Male deer do not normally... You know, interact with each other, right? They have their own their own things. So again, supernatural things, strange things happening. And there's Sasquatch in the very far back. Yes. If you look to the right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then Ashtaka's curse response, um, and we realize, oh yes, things are connected here. Um, um, and so then we go to Iron Town. Um, and I love how Miyazaki presents this. That he really presents it from Miyazaki's perspective. I'm sorry, from Ashitaka's perspective, where the ox drivers are jubilant, um, and Ashitaka's like, what the hell is this? Like, what's yeah, with all it's this ugly. smoke? It's Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's ugly and just, the just landscape's bizarre. landscape's denuded. Mm -hmm. There's constant it's like smoldering lining. from it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Strip mining the whole nine yards. And yeah, I mean, I, I doubt if that was home for me, I'd probably be like, but I like the green. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I uh -huh. like the green. I don't mm -hmm. like this mud. Well, also, and, and... Ashtaka's village is a village. Yeah. You know what I mean, you don't get a right. great view of it. They have a watchtower. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a stockade, perhaps. Yeah. But this is very specifically built on the, the very edge of the shore. Mm -hmm. And there are these massive the spiky pieces yep. put into the hillside to prevent people from getting to the wall. And then the barricade, you know, up along a whole side, and they, you know, it's just like, wow, this is to him. I imagine this is a the most massive fortification he's ever seen. Absolutely, <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, th this is like seeing a zeppelin, right? It's like, what, the, what on earth is yeah. this? Um, um, and it is high technology. Um, and so we get some uh, some wonderful shots of uh, Iron Town. Um, by the way. Um, something in this, which we'll get to back to later. We get a lot of shots, actually, of various people in Irontown um, uh, and all sorts of, of folks coming out to see things. Um, there's one thing you don't see in any of these shots. Uh, it's in every other Miyazaki um, movie and it's in other shots of villages in Princess Mononoke. I did not notice this until Okada pointed out to me. Pets. Mm -hmm. Kids? Kids. No, there's... Yeah. Weren't some of those people running around children? I thought. There's not a single child in Iron Town. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we'll get back to that in a second. Um, so they come out, and it's a frontier town, right? Like, right. this is not a place to raise kids, in fairness. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so, yeah, so Ashaka comes in. We get the, again, a bit of levity um, with uh, Kuroki's wife coming out. Um, uh, wonderfully played here. Um, 
and you get a sense again of this, and we've talked before about uh, Miyazaki being an old communist, an old leftist, um, and we get a sense that this is not a dictatorship. <laughs> When 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 he starts talking to the people around, this is and when okay. So when I when you first see Iron Town, first you notice it's ugly. And you see the, the 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 hills around it, you know, very worked over, strip mine, yeah, yeah. the whole mine yard, and you have the the people in sort of system going on, mm. where women are at the forefront, but the women are also working, and at first you feel like. Oh, this lady, this you know, this this woman who's mm -hmm. in charge of everything is abusing these women, right? You know, forcing them to work the forge, and then you come to find out, no, 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 this is this is our job. Yep, we would rather be doing this than being prostitutes. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and we would actually rather work to earn our pay, and then yeah. everyone's in it together. Then I'm just like, like, oh yeah, Miyazaki was the leftist, and now I'm being. <laughs> so, um, Welcome to the workers' utopia, where everybody has, yeah, exactly. you know, relative equality. Yeah, exactly. There we go. And, um, and, and, and so, and so, so the big forge reminds me of the the Stalin projects mm. that he used, the, the people's projects. Yes, you know, we're you know we're going to put like a hundred people, hundred million people to this big factory, one big factory making this one thing. Mm -hmm. And that's how. We, and then we're gonna have another factory. We can this other big. One. It, it yep. goes on, but that's where literally you're smacking the stick with stick. With yeah, um, and Toshio Okada believes that uh, Lady Eboshi is inspired by Chairman Mao um, as this revolutionary leader who was very much about you know, giving this this um, um, ideal life to the people, um, but it didn't Using quite work out so well. Great leap forward. Great leap forward. Right. Technology. Yeah. You know, to the people and get people. Running headlong into the future, and, and starving oops. tens of millions, of tens people. of millions, <laughs> and you know, ironworks being a central part of that. You know, Mao really wanted right. to say, "We will beat the UK in steel production in 15 years." Um, you know, everyone's going to work in, in in iron, and turns out not everyone's good at doing that. Um, yeah, turns but... out you need to grow things like crops and feed people. You know, <laughs> strange because yeah. collectivized a farming. Thing. You know, when you just bang it out one day is a great idea. <laughs> it's quite go like that. Land. Yeah, um, but everything's fine. Thank you. Um, <laughs> everything <laughs> great. Yeah, every, everything's fine. Yes, Chairman. Yes, everything's fine. Um, yes, we we see all this happening. Um, um, and then um, Ashok is brought into Lady Eboshi's little private garden. Um, and again, I love Miyazaki sending all this up. We're like, okay, yeah, Eboshi, dictator for life, right? Like, clearly, this is what's going on. Um, but then he walks in, and first off, you got to know what this would smell like, this room. Yeah. It's full of lepers. And Well, can I ask a question as, as a mm -hmm. sort of a, a hidden nod, uh, yeah. nod and a wink? that Ashitaka is invited into Lady Eboshi's private garden. Ah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Probably. That kind of have it, had occurred to me. It's like yeah. she brings the stranger in to get to know him, and I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, just walk by this. Walk by <laughs> it. There's a greater plot issue going on here. Just mm -hmm. let the private garden go. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. No, there's there's definitely a, um, yeah. some symbolism there. Yeah. Um, and as Josh as pointed out, like, this is to be, you know, other people react and say, wait, really? Like he's able to, you know, you're, you're inviting him there. Um, yeah. So this is clearly not something that most people can, can do. And in fact, it's guarded with a guy with a uh, spear and a gun. Yeah. You know, um, so. It's like she has her own musket force. And here this, literally, this stranger from nowhere shows up and he gets the grand tour. Uh -huh. like, oh, yeah. Okay, interesting. The tale of Ashitaka. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the leper room must have been. Oh. Yeah, so he knows what's going on here. Like, he, he knows what, what this is. And when the lepers are immediately like, no, no, you can't judge Lady Eboshi too harshly. She's the only one who took us in, the only one who took the women in. Um, you know, she is doing good in the world. Um, with firearms. With firearms, yes. Yeah. Um, and one of the uh, immediate things she says is that, you know, this is, these aren't for me, these are for my women. So the women can defend themselves because they can't defend themselves with sword play, but they can with guns. Um, so it's this fascinating sort of feminist, you know, argument in in a real way. Um, and then you get the scene where 
Ashitaka tries to kill Lady Eboshi. Um, and this is where you realize, oh, well, not necessarily real, but this is where the curse starts to become a thing, right? Yeah. This is not just a right. neat power he has. This is something he is actively having to push back at all times. Yeah. Um, because he can take him over, and, and as he says, you know, if it would lift the curse, I would kill you, but it won't. This doesn't solve anything. Um, and he's After right. After some of the hand flipping mm-hmm. and stuff. Love like, that. Um, Ash the evil <clears throat> dead. Like, yeah. right. <laughs> oh, no. If only they had chain t- saw technology then. Katu, Barada. Did you say the phrase? <laughs> uh, yeah, mostly. <laughs> um, uh, and you get a moment. That, this, this moment hit me hard. Um, when the uh, the leper speaks, yeah, the the dying older guy, presumably. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah. mm-hmm. um, I I just love his philosophy. Life is hard. It's full of suffering. What do you do with that? Basically, you know, Iboshi is finding things to do, and one of the reasons and folks were asking in the chat, like, why did Miyazaki put you know, make this sort of warlord female? I think one of the reasons is to have a is, is to show there there are lots of historical examples of women who you know took charge and really did some amazing things. This is very much one of those you know um, one of those sorts of characters. And what he's pointing out here is that you know, Iboshi it does not just um, live with the hand she's dealt. Um, you know she's very much taking charge and, and doing things and trying to make the world a better place from her perspective. Um, um, and so then we, we we get a little bit more context of what's going on. Um, where we find out uh, that, from Lady Eboshi's perspective, this is all unnatural. The forest spirit and the gods and so forth are not the way things should be. Um, the, the gods have basically corrupted the forest, in a sense, and turned everything supernatural. Kill the great forest spirit, and the world goes to what it is now. Right? It becomes the normal world. Um, and this is such a brilliant moment because you realize, oh, this is history in a way, right? Like, like this is somebody trying to make the world what it, we're used to now. Um, trying to slay to myth and magic and mm-hmm. make, it a, make it a human world. Yeah, exactly. That's what she's trying to do. And that then sucks. she's. Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, and then she says something which I found weird at the time, and which now I think I understand. Um, she says, if, I, if we kill the great forest spirit, then um, everything goes back to the way it, w- it was, and Princess Mononoke will go back to being human. Why does she care? Why would she point that out? Because the hell that San is visiting on her efforts to get rice and supplies into her ironworks. But why not more? San... Well, but if San goes back to human, mm-hmm. and there's no more gods, mm-hmm. San can't do anything. Yeah, San loses her well, her ability to affect Iboshi's operations. Or is San her daughter? I don't know. Yes, that is what I think. Yeah, because, uh, and we're gonna jump forward here a little bit. Yeah, we talk about San. Yeah, something very interesting happens later in the movie. A lot of interesting things happen later in the movie yeah. when. Um, San attacks. The oh, there we go. Iron Town. San attacks Iron Town. Notice something that uh, again. What does Lady Eboshi not do? In this fight. She never attacks. Yeah. yeah. She also smiles throughout the entire thing. Getting back to the weird smiles. Lady Eboshi isn't cruel. Right? She's never shown to be have this sort of cat and mouse perspective on things. Why is she smiling? Could it be because she is proud of how strong her daughter is? Wow. Hmm. Remember I said you'll never see a, a child in Irontown, right? What if they have a no child policy? And what if Lady Eboshi established that low child policy by abandoning her own daughter in the forest for the wolves. Oof, ah. Yeah. 
See, I thought she was smiling because of just, you know, tactically. Mm -hmm. San has walked into death. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yep. you look at that still shot right mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Lady yeah. Yoboshi has all the cards. Right. She's got firearms. Mm -hmm. She's got a ton of people. Yep. <laughs> and everybody behind her mm -hmm. has, like, a Naganata or yep. some other blade. Mm -hmm. And San has a little knife. Yep. And it's like, I thought she was smiling because she was just kind of like, this girl, she's got, you know, she's got mm -hmm. chops. Yep. But there is no hope of success. She can go at me all day she wants, but the minute I nod, all these people mm -hmm. are going to cut her down. And this is the thing. Everywhere else in the movie, in every other situation, Lady Eboshi would have simply nodded. Yeah. There's no reason for her to hold back. Yeah. She's a very no-nonsense person. Wow. Yeah. And, and never thought of that. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and Okada said, you know... He, this came to his mind. This is a popular theory. He went back and he researched. He said, did Miyazaki ever say this? Did Suzuki ever say this? That this is the thing. They have not. However, Miyazaki wrote all sorts of stuff about the backstories of all the characters. And Eboshi and Moro and Okoto. By the way, when they were recording Moro's dialogue, um, the voice actor... When he said, and it was, it's a male voice actor in the Japanese, uh, he says, um, finally, Akoto, a boar who will listen to reason. Um, he just kind of says it like that. And Miyazaki, like, rushed out of the, the recording room, the, the, the booth, and went to the guy and said, mm, you, you, you got to say it with, with, with more emotion. Because, you see, Moro and Akoto used to be lovers. So they have this whole history going back. <laughs> and the voice actor just said, excuse me? Boar wolf? What, what, uh, did, yeah, so, so they have this whole history, so there needs to be like this affection behind it. This sense of, you know, of, of we have a history behind it. And, and Okada explains all this, and he says, Miyazaki, how the heck are we supposed to know this? <laughs> like, why are you putting this into your... Like, what? Um, and we would never have known this if there didn't happen to be a documentary crew in the recording booth while this happened to capture this one exchange. So there's all this backstory... The only backstory Miyazaki or Suzuki have ever said about San is the line in the movie. She was abandoned in the forest. So it is very much in keeping with Miyazaki's style. If that is, if he is being silent about that, that's something he wants the audience to figure out. That is a, a, a thing he wants to, to figure out. And this makes a lot of other interactions make sense. This is, in a sense, a movie about two mothers with this daughter, right? They're trying to protect from each other. You know? Um, and San doesn't know. She has no idea what's going on. Right. Um, but, yeah, that's a thing, I think. Again, well, we don't know, be, but... A lot of, a lot of San's, you know suicidal charge into the into mm -hmm. iron town is fraught with the absolute possibility of death when you look yeah. at she, when she's on the roof they mm -hmm. blow part of the right. roof up yeah. trying to get at her mm -hmm. you don't see iboshi doing anything to stop it you don't right. also see her saying blow her off the roof you know cut her head off mm -hmm. right you know what i mean so it's like mm -hmm. it, it, i that's really that's a razor's edge on that yep. to be like that theory because mm -hmm. as a proud mother she isn't being like you know let her go you know we'll get her well, later or anything you know what I mean but, or a, but this kind is of indication not to kill her this they is also the mother who abandoned her though right right if she, if she yeah. gave up on San she's like she's my enemy I accept her as my enemy I'm gonna try to defeat her right but I'm not gonna try that hard. <laughs> <laughs> right? Ah, who knows? Oh, wow. It should um, happen that everything turns out great. Right. You know, it's good. If she but accidentally I gets shot with this gun, <laughs> that'll I, be her problem. I, 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 I built my own little province here, and this mm -hmm. is kind of inconvenient. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Can we no. just not have that? Um, and, we, and, and this is actually one of my favorite move, scenes like in cinema, when Ashitaka um, steps forward um, and bends the sword and then just stops the fight, just cold. Yeah. Um, and again, this is this is not a good m moment for Ashitaka. He is letting the sickness grow through him. He is becoming the boar god, basically. Yeah. Um, that is happening to him. 
um, and he's letting it happen because he needs to send a message. So, as heroic as this is, this is also a bad sign for Ashitaka, um, because he's giving into it, if you will. Um, but it's it's this great like, who is right here, you know? Um, it's a classic third choice where he comes in and he's like, "You're both wrong. You both need to stop." <laughs> Uh, but also, like, there's no solution to this. Well, it's also interesting that, from his perspective, he already knows he has a very limited time to live. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's struggling with this, and at this point, you know what I mean? It's kind of mm -hmm. like he's letting it unleash a little mm -hmm. because you get the sense, like, he's getting to the point where he's seeing more and more and more. So, you know what I mean? There's a lot of reasons to not keep holding back and keep staying separate. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons to just yeah. go for it because you're going to die. Right. You know what I mean? And that, mm -hmm. that that's the inescapable in his mind. There might yeah. be a cure. There might not. But you mm -hmm. know what I mean? You're going to do the thing. I mean, so as go as, forward. As he, you know? as, he's, as he carries Son out mm. yeah, and he gets shocked. Yeah. You know, he's, uh. He gets shot, and he just and he's just like going. It just keeps moving. He just you know he holds her, and then mm -hmm. and then he goes up to the gate, and then the guy and the two men there mm -hmm. were grateful to him. Like just like you know, dude, don't do this, don't do this. Yeah. And he's just like no, and and then he just pushes, uses mm -hmm. the power, yep. shot with the right arm, the, you know, with the power yeah. arm, right? Yeah, right. And and pushing it open, shot carrying money. This is the god at work mm -hmm. you know and where he through, shot it looked like it lunged him yeah i mean that's right. that's like a, he should be on the floor yeah i mean know. that would have blown out his scapula straight through his chest mm -hmm. cavity and where that mm -hmm. exit wound is lunged mm -hmm. and you just you generally just don't push giant multi-ton <laughs> doors after you've been lunged. right <laughs> well like lady boshi says it'll do more than that to kill a god yeah. Right. And that's just happening. He's he's turning into one of those. Um, uh, yeah. And but it's it's a it's a great scene. Partly because again he is no longer using his powers. F he is just using his powers to calmly leave. Yeah. Um, and just not cause any more problems, if you will. Um, yeah. Because when you saw when San bit him and his mm -hmm. arm looks yeah. like it has eels glued to it. Mm -hmm. Again, he there's the knowledge that there might be a cure. The knowledge that he's going to die. And he still makes the rational choice not to be like, no, I'll just go bananas and let it go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's still got mm -hmm. enough yeah. control to it to dial it back in yeah. to just leave. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and then you get, this scene always makes me laugh, I admit, um, as sad of a scene as it is, um, uh, because uh, Ashiraka finally falls off. And um, let's see here. Um, can we get it here? Go, um, yeah, cool. Go yeah. kick her off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and one of the wolves immediately goes back and tries to bite his head off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, it's just like, like a rag doll. <laughs> you know, it's just like a cat when the, the owner dies and nobody knows. And the cat is just like, hey, devils. Actually, right. the soft part. <laughs> All right. I just got like it became the wolf's own chew toy. I'm yeah, like, pretty much. Um... And then um, again, makes me laugh. And then we get the, the scene with the the um, the gorillas and I, with the apes, uh, which just adds the other layer of we are just trying to protect the forest. We're trying to plant the trees. We're trying to do the right thing. It isn't working. We are taking the pacifist path, right? We're not attacking the humans. We're just trying to get the forest back. That isn't working. And so we're going to try to take the desperate step of eating the flesh of the human. Um, well, I find it interesting too that these are not Japanese macaques, right? They are no. very much no. like a chimpanzee-esque mm -hmm. yeah. kind of creature. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I would have thought you would have gone with a Japanese macaque because that's, yeah. that's a native animal to the area. So mm -hmm. this is really an other. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's like a proto-human. Mm -hmm. you know, eating the flesh of the human well, bring it, them closer to people and yeah. give them, you know, more human Well, power. here's the... Like, well, here's the thing for me. When, when that scene first comes up, mm -hmm. and you know they talk about the eating and taking of the power, and you're just like, okay. And she and San points out that you know that's you know, that's that's just foolishness. Yeah. And then later on, you know, you when the the other board guy comes in and they talk about, look, you see our numbers are we're growing smaller. Oh. And we're, we're, 
stupid. That line. Oh. And, you know, and and I hearken back to the chimpanzees because the chimpanzees at that moment in the movie are articulating fairly well frustrations, strategy, yeah. things, so forth and so on. And then I was just kind of thinking about it, but they say, want to do this stupid thing. And then I'm just kind of like, are they start? Is this using a chimpanzee to show animal intelligence mm. and then showing them grow more and more stupid, yeah. stupid yeah. as time goes on? Because, you know, by the end of the movie, they're they're literally all they're doing is throwing sticks and yeah. barely able to talk in coherent sentences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So this is, you know, the power of Possible. what's happening around. Well, this is another thing. And we'll get to it a, a little bit later is that. Um, there's also the, the deeper layer of what we what they mean by the forest is dying. Um, I don't think that simply means the forest is being chopped down. I think it means that people are, are not worshipping the forest the way they used to. Right. You know, spiritually, the, the power of the gods is weakening, uh, which has everybody, you know, <laughs> freaked out in the god community, basically. Well, I think um, Merlin said it well is when the coming of the one god silences the voices of the many gods. Right. Exactly. You know, it's like, oh, oh, yeah. The right. time, the time of man has come. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, and they're creepy. By the way, the, the, um, the way they got uh, the the voice of the gods is that they took a second microphone and put it on the neck of the voice actors, oh. and that created that that sort of weird echoey sound. Of the, oh, okay. you know, which is pretty cool. Uh, we also get, one, again, one of my favorite lines in this, where um, uh, you know, the, the apes go away, and um, uh, San mentions Yakul, and uh, I says, man, he's just been standing there waiting. And Will goes, yes, can I eat him? <laughs> and San goes, you know, in a very sort of familial way, no, that. you may not. No. <laughs> and he goes, Ugh, and just walks off. And it's just like, yeah, yeah, very much that that brother of like, all right, fine, sis, I will eat him. Um, and I just love the Yakul that one shot where he's just standing there mom. in the yep. shadow of the rock, and Yakul is just standing there watching, like very patiently. Yeah. Like, oh. Well, and I, I talked about one of my panels about the fact that Yakul is this very interesting character in a sense in the movie, and that he is this completely domesticated animal that also serves a very important role, right? Like, we would think in a movie like this, it's about independence, it's about, you know, gods and so forth. Yakul shows a very healthy, domesticated animal-human relationship where they, you know, they help each other very, very, yeah. very much. Um, you know, Ashaka would not be as effective as a warrior without Yakul, and y- right. Yakul would not last five right. minutes without the Ashtaka. Um... Uh, so yeah, so San takes Ashitaka to the Great Forest Bit, and this is where we first meet him. And Shelby pointed out, and again, one of the, the things about it is that we not only see life, we see death. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's bones and skeletons all over the place because that is what this is. Um, and we finally meet the Great Forest Spirit for the first time, um, who is very much based on, well, we see the Nightwalker first, um, but then the Great Forest Spirit. Um, oh, and we got get all this stuff. I forgot about all this. Uh, the, well, the well hold on. Yeah. Did you? Is there any description as to mm-hmm. why San pulls the twig? Oh yeah. And sticks it over Ashitaka's head. Mm-hmm. Is because I was I've mm-hmm. always been curious about that, and I did, I forgot to look it up. Mm-hmm. So but why is that like a thing that's an indicator? What plant is that? Is it a specific plant that draws the attention? Is we're supposed to know that? So I don't think so. I think what's happening here is that Ashitaka need. I'm sorry, San is leading Yakul with the plant. Um, okay. Because she gets into the water and she offers it, and Yakul comes after the plant. Okay. And so she is basically, um, you know, uh, nicking that and using it to, to pull him over. However, when she, well, she goes, tells to the him other he side, can't go on the island right. because it'll, mm-hmm. he'll die. So right. he just stands there. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, but she needs to lead him across so he can she can get Ashitaka across. But then okay. she plants it. To indicate, I'm not throwing this away, right? I am essentially replanting this on the other side, so there's a chance to grow or whatever. Um, you know, it, or it's keep it, Yakul's focus, right? Somehow, maybe. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, okay. Beyond that, I don't know. Um, we do know it's not going to live, um, yeah. uh, because the Great Forest Spirit comes in, um, and so the Great Forest Spirit is very much um, actually based on a real thing. 
uh, looks like an earth dragon. I mean, mm. in its giant night walking format, yeah. I'm like, oh my god, it's mm -hmm. a dragon. <laughs> so, so these are very much based on real things. So, so the night walker is based on a Japanese legend of a thing called the land strider, is how it's often translated. It's a yokai that just strides across the land at night and um, uh, just does that. That's all it does, I understand. Um, does it interact or does it just stride? And it just strides. It just walks. Uh, you'll occasionally see this giant shadowy mm. thing, you know, walking uh, in the distance um, or walking over you. Um, uh, whereas the sort of day form of uh, the Great Forest Spirit is a um, um, is based on a painting, a uh, famous Buddhist painting of a um, of this creature that is meant to represent um, various aspects of, of, of Buddhism. Uh, and I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's, it's this famous painting. It was painted in a in a Buddhist monastery, um, uh, and it's come to represent um, uh, things. So it's, it's basically a, a um, again a reference back to this sort of visual image of this this great elk as a representation of life and death. Um, uh, yeah, and here we start getting more plot with Okoto showing up. Um, and it should be pointed out, this, this is another point where we remember that this is a very, this is a movie set in a specific time. They tell us how old Okoto is. Um, yeah. You know, the, these are all very specific times and places in history. Um, uh, so we have you know, our, our montage sequence where Ashaka wakes up, he finds out what's going on. Um, he finds that it, the wound is healed, but not the curse. Uh, which is a wonderfully tragic, bittersweet moment uh, in the movie. Uh, and then we get the sweet kiss of life from San. Uh, the beef jerky. The beef jerky, because Ashitaka cannot swallow on his own. Um, he's too weak, so San so gets a little thing. Somebody to give him a choking hazard. Yep. And we talked before about kind of the hidden eroticism in Ghibli films. I think this is definitely one of those where, okay, we get a kiss. Here's how we get a kiss. It's through this scene uh, between the two of them. Son would, would not do that uh, deliberately. Um, I chose to point out something that uh, must have driven all of them crazy. Um, when San slashes Ashitaka, um, it slashes his cheek and puts a notch on his uh, uh, cowl. Uh, you see that little notch there? Which meant they had to track in every shot of Ashitaka they were drawing, whether it was post-cut or pre-cut. Yep. Oi. Oi. Oh, wow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and later on, you see it's actually been sewn closed. So that's another yeah. thing you have to add in it. Yeah. Um, again, that's, that's Miyazaki showing off a little can, can, bit. Can you just imagine the animators there in the storyboard when they see the storyboard the first time and they notice that detail that there's <laughs> like... Really? Uh. <laughs> the whole film. Yeah. No, he goes to the uh, to the Anishi shop and he just buys a new one. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, that's a great solution. <laughs> totally. um, yeah. Uh, and so now we get the confrontation between the boars um, and the wolves. Um, and here's where you start getting some of the, the, this backstory. And again, some of these hints that there's more going on. Because um, I, I think this is not just about the... Um, this is where I think it's, this is more about worship. Why are the why are more boars coming to this part of the forest? Presumably, it's because their part of the forest has even less worship of nature than this part of the forest. Um, so the the circle is closing, if you will, on on this this nature worship, uh, and so they they're forced out of their area essentially to come to this forest to, to save it uh, as one of the last bastions of what's going on. Um, uh, and so we get a koto. Um, who apparently has a thing with Moro. I don't know. Don't know how that works. Don't want to know, but yeah, you know. It's, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. Um, and, and again, that line. And again, that, that line hit me hard too. You know, look at us, Moro. We grow small and we grow stupid. We're stupid. What a line for a, you know, a leader to say in front of his own people because yeah. that's when you know they're done. Right. This is the and he says we will give them a fight. They will never forget, even if the last one of us dies. It's like, oh man, you're gonna do it, aren't you? Yeah, you're gonna do it. Regardless uh, of the chances of winning, you're just going to do the thing, and mm -hmm. yeah. it's not gonna go well. Nope. Um. Uh, and so now we get you know 
Iboshi boars, being Iboshi. If nothing else, the boars are pig-headed. Yeah. Um, and now we get we get more again more more plot and backstory about Iboshi. What's going on with her? Um, um, and the fact that there's a there's a lot more that, at stake here than we might think that she actually has something going on with uh, with Jigo. Yeah. Um, so basically, we we realize here that. Basically, Jigo gave Iboshi all the tools she needed to establish herself here. Yeah. And the price she pays is killing off the Great Forest Spirit. Um, which, again, adds an interesting element to it that she doesn't necessarily want to. Right? Like, she knows she has to, and that's the best kind of thing. But um, Also, by the way, do you notice uh, in this... Uh, did you notice uh, Washu in the English dub? Um, uh, Washu from Tenchi Moyo is one of the ladies... Uh, in Iron Town, uh, oh. and she's doing basically Washu's voice in this. Oh, I miss that. Yeah, oh. it's, it's, it's kind of fun. When you watch it in Japanese, you don't hear. Yeah, that. exactly. Um, the I don't know. Well, if this that is would be insane that. if Washu. Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Washu built the time machine. <laughs> How the hell? I heard that? you were having some trouble, so I decided to stop by. <laughs> um, she's gonna make everything okay. <laughs> exactly. The forest will be fine. Oh, cool. <laughs> Um, I don't know if this is deliberate, but I've noticed in most of the Disney dubs, um, some notable anime voice actor shows up somewhere. Um, and I don't know if that was just kind of them saying, let's pull in somebody, right? Let's, 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 let's have a little fun there. Whoever um, answered the phone call. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes, we know. And, and again, this is that scene where she goes, you know, do you, do you know who the emperor is? No idea. Should we know? <laughs> yeah. Not relevant to any of these people. Um, yeah, so plot, 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 plot. Um, uh, and now we find in Nishi's, I'm sorry, uh, Lady Eboshi's mistake. Um, when she says, okay, we're going to go off to kill the Great Forest Spirit. I'm going to leave you here with these rifles. You you hold off Lord Asano. That didn't work well. Um... And I mean, that was a complete telegraph in that, how the, how the film yeah. was going to go at that moment. You're like, okay, yeah, here's the pivot point. Bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody needs a hero right now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. hey, here we go. Y y you know, it's bad when the lepers get into the action. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shots of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, um, do we the get bad back to thing this? about leper uh, uh, formations is they all fall apart. Uh, um, Anywho. Yeah. <laughs> so Ashago wakes up in uh, Moro's kind of den. And what do you notice about Moro's den? What is this? Again, I had to have Okada point this out to me. Please don't tell me it's a death frame again. Death. No. <laughs> Grave of the fire. No, no. It's a Tori. Basically, this is this is not natural. Entering into the spiritual right. space. This is clearly man-made. It's Stonehenge, right. basically, right? Mm, okay. So this is basically an old temple. It's a temple to the wolf god. Interesting. That's why Maro yeah. is here. Because Maro was worshipped by the humans. That's how she became a god. That's how wolf gods came to be. Right. And so she is still hanging out because she still has an affection for humans. Hence her adopting son. Exactly. And not eating her. Yeah. But, um, but it's interesting that she has that conversation with him when, when he walks out mm -hmm. in, in the night and it's just oh, that beautiful valley oh. look. And as he's, you know, walking toward you know on that ledge there that that yeah. you know, which is that actually perfectly level like ledge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah unnaturally so and he's walking out there and you and he's walking out there and i'm like thinking to myself going god he's gonna jump isn't he mm. and then she says she says you might as well jump yep just go ahead it would just solve everything mm. right now and from her perspective it really would yeah um you know to, in, in terms of song mm-hmm and then, you know, have that wonderful conversation between the two of them. Well, and that's another interesting thing here. Um, if you see um, Moro as kind of an adopted mother, there's also an aspect here of the, the scary Obasan, 
of the scary mother, yeah. you know, talking to the prospective <laughs> husband-to-be, saying, yeah. so, you think you're hot stuff? You think you can really protect my daughter? You think you can do all this stuff? That's very much what she's saying here. And she's kind of probing the waters to see how, you know, what is Ashitaka's reaction to all these things? Um, because the other thing about Maro is that um, she never really speaks her mind. Um, she's a really interesting character to me because she's always deflecting. Um, and she's always kind of making these sarcastic statements. Um, uh, and she's just so, so good at that. Um, and to the point where she does this wonderful, like, thing, um, where, <laughs> um, she basically tells him, like, no, like, this isn't going to work. Um, you know, you are, you are foolish to think that you can do any of this stuff. And I can't find it, dang it. Um... Um, but where she basically mocks him, um, that line, there we go, uh, where suddenly she becomes a wolf god, <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, where the mouth just becomes absurdly huge, really big. which might remind you of another Studio Ghibli character who has a very large mouth, right? It's not Totoro again. Yeah, Totoro again, right? There's a little bit of that. Uh, Kiki's anyway. delivery service. Yeah. Hmm. Um... No. <laughs> but yeah, I think she is kind of testing Ashtaka a little bit. Um, where so not... Go ahead. Just a little aside here, yeah. uh, speaking of Totoro. So the entire time I, I'm watching this based on when we were talking about Totoro and the connection to this movie, mm -hmm. I was like, I was just like, where is he in the fight? Where is he? Where is he? I actually was, <laughs> part of me was actually looking for him. Yeah. In, in the movie, but. Yeah. Uh. Um, and then we get the scene, which this blew my mind when Okada told me about it. So the, we have the scene where Ashaka comes in, sits down, and looks at San in this, and they have this very nice conversation. He gives her this, you know, this very comforting look. Um, and then we see her there with her legs sticking out of the, the thing, and they have this nice, quiet conversation. Apparently, when Toshio Suzuki saw the storyboards, he went to Miyazaki and he said, Did they do it? Like, is that what you're implying here? With this very, you know, casual, you know, yeah. bed thing, you know, bedside manner kind of a thing. And Miyazaki refused to answer. And Suzuki kept probing him and probing him. And eventually Miyazaki said, well, it's obvious if you look at it. So this is the the post event pillow yes, talk. Yes, exactly. That that is ah. that is the implication here. With and, with, with, with Mama Wolf. Over <laughs> exactly. Over, over, yeah. Um, which blew my mind until I realized Ashitaka and San interact completely differently from this point on in the film. Interesting. Right. There, there's none of the back and forth. There's none of the you know I'm going to kill you. They are much closer after this point. Okay, I don't think Miyazaki is like deliberately telling the audience that's what's happening, but he's kind of saying this is a this is a way you can interpret this that does fit with what's going on, right? Interesting. Um, and, and I mean, there's anime, and then there's this film. Because you yes, know, right. you know, right. anime, you'd have a guy and a girl wake up next to each other, and it'd be like, oh, oh no, we can right. never get married now. <laughs> uh, so, totally different scenario. Yeah. But that is very interesting. Yes, that they are they have very civil mm -hmm. interaction with. Uh, and not... and again, different societies, different cultures, right? That, yeah. that, is, that, that does not have the same connotation it does now. Right? You can just do that. Also note, you know, Mama Wolf is above saying that she's ready to chop his head off, you know, the slightest provocation, and he has to leave at dawn. When does he wake up? Like 11 a.m.? Yeah. Right. It's like full on <laughs> <laughs> So I don't think she was quite as serious as she was letting on. I think she was being scary Mama Wolf there. Um, wow. And even left behind stuff. Yeah. So who knows? Um... Um, so, yeah, so, so now Ashitaka is ready to leave. Uh, he, he sends the dagger back. Uh, and now things get serious. Here's where we enter into the climax of the film. Um, where we discover all that's going on 
um, and the actual end. And again, I, I love how Miyazaki gives us characters who know what's going on, where Moro sees this and goes, oh, they're just trying to draw the, the boars out. They're making it stink, which is annoying, which, that it, which is meant to make, make it be annoying, which does all these sorts of things, and this is what's going to happen. Um, and this is, again, where Moro becomes a, a, a more complicated character. She's not just trying to kill the humans, right? She, 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 she understands what's going on and is smart enough not to just leap in. Um, and so San then realizes when she, when she gets the dagger, she has to leave. And here's the one moment where I think Moro becomes a mother for a moment, if you will, because she goes, do what you must. Um, and let San leave and is like, you know, Okay, okay, child, it's time for you to be an adult now, if you will, um, and leave the nest. Uh, um, and so she does. Um, well, this is the thing I kind of wonder, thinking about all the discussion about, you know, the, the spirit animals are all getting dumber. Mm -hmm. You know, their, their, their time is, is beginning, the sun is beginning to set on their time. Yeah. That Moro stays more lucid yeah i think mm -hmm. because domestication of the dog didn't make dogs dumber right it made them used to us mm -hmm. and it made us used to them mm -hmm. so that we could like san and moro can work together and to do things cooperatively exactly wild boar mm. are intensely dangerous and intensely smart yeah but a domestic pig is far less dangerous and mm -hmm. far more docile because it needs to be so we can feed from it. Yep. So you're yep. getting the boars charging in because they're getting dumber as the process mm -hmm. is going along mm -hmm. versus yeah. more still able to stand back and be like, okay, you know, I kind of get the human thing because I, I kind of get you, son. Yeah. I kind of how this works. I see what's going on here. I'm not having part of that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Like, it's a great point. Interesting. Yeah. It's an interesting and it's just pointed out, like, you know, where are, where's the bird god, right? Yeah. Like, like, where are all the other gods of all the other animals? Um, these are the only ones out left. Not to be involved. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, and think about yeah. it too. Do the apes show up? Right. The boars are on the move. Mm -hmm. And the apes, they're trying to figure it out. Like, oh, yeah. if we consume Ashtaka, they, you know, yeah. that'll, that'll give us an answer. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they don't show up to this fight. Well, actually, in, in fact, we see them briefly, right? And they're not running with the boars. No, and they're not even <laughs> oh. God-touched anymore. They're just apes. Um, you know, the whole thing. And this is another interesting thing that you notice here, um, which, again, took me a little while to, uh, to recognize. Um, um, we're not even seeing the red eyes anymore, right? These are just boars. Um, they're obviously in, in influenced by the, by the god and so forth and so on. But even that is starting to, to die out um, as this goes along. Um, and so Ashitaka um, finally goes back to Iron Town, uh, and we get again one of my favorite lines of the movie, um, uh, where a little opening pulls out and a guy <laughs> shoots a thing and cracks it in half, and he goes, "Ha, ah, I missed." Um, <laughs> and again, it's Miyazaki bringing a little levity to a very serious moment where Iron Town clearly is falling. Like this is not working out the way Lady Boshi meant it to, um, and they're just doing their best there. Um, and we get these little moments again. This is, I think, this is Miyazaki being a geek uh, and showing the the, the signal arrow. The yep. guy pulls mm -hmm. back and. <laughs> Um, and Ashitaka hears that, and he knows what that means. Um, that everyone's being called to, to him. Um, and so he gets the, the heck out of Dodge. And then we get, again, and we see it, it's, being, it's been sewed up. Um, uh, and who sewed that up? It's on. There was no, no one else around to do it. Um, Where did Son learn sewing skills? Yeah. As the daughter of one. Yeah, <laughs> good, good question. Um, I guess she had to, and she has clothes, right? I guess he must have Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. where did she get the mask? Mm-hmm, right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Stolen from here and there. Yep. 
And this is where, again, we get another signal that things are not going well for Ashitaka. Um, because here is a point where Ashitaka, um, and again, amazing moment, um, but these guys attack him, and he decides to do a thing. Um, whoops. Honestly, when you have a mounted soldier with a Naganatha, yep. he's coming at you, he's yeah. got way mm -hmm. better reach than that doll. Yeah, <laughs> you know yeah I mean? exactly. Like, uh -huh. but, he's going to cut you in half like mm -hmm. before you even have a chance. <laughs> but here's the thing. You, you know, Ashaka sees it's happening, and he warns them, but he, like, straight up assassinates these men. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, um... Yeah. One of, one of, one of the things of the actual animation of this mm. attack and his response to it yep. was with his his little sword was that as he's moving to knock the arrow you you hear the ring on his finger. Yeah. On the, from the mm -hmm. hill and you see it move and you see the utility of that. Yeah. And it was it's I thought it was just, you know, that's those are just the, the little details that that Absolutely. Those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And then you get to see the arrow fly and do horrific yeah. <laughs> mind bending things like choop, there goes the head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um uh, where one of the other guy goes, Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm gonna go. I'm, I'm gonna done. Um but again, this, this is and, and we, we even see the curse, you know, expanding. But again, this is Ashitaka saying, I'm not gonna negotiate or can try anything else i'm going to let this do the thing that it does so ashitaka is turning into a little bit more of a boar god here not just like letting it go but this is again i think ashitaka an hour earlier in the film would not have done this he would have found some other um interaction but he's mm, is a problem um, well the chip the chips are down really with yeah. this because i mean it's it's going south Every which way, mm, iron town yeah. people are, are getting yeah. a little bit yep. knocked yeah. out of them the and boars are getting decimated right. it's just everything's going wrong at the same time and yakul gets hit yeah oh i was not happy about it. oh not that i was happy yeah. with the wars dying either mm -hmm. but... yeah but again it hits you right yakul has yeah. been this great companion the entire time you're like no you can't do this to us miyazaki it's like shooting okay. silver no the lone <laughs> ranger's horse doesn't get shot exactly crazy. yes don't do that don't shoot trigger you know right it's, it's, we, these are Precious, yeah. precious animals. Yeah. Um, and so you get... Yeah. Uh, and so now we find out what's actually happened in the fact that this was not simply a fight. This was a massacre. Um, it should also be pointed out, um, you know, the townspeople were put on the front lines where the bombs were. Yeah. yeah. Who put them there? Lady Eboshi did. Right? She knew what was going to happen. She knew that that was going to happen to her people, and she accepted that sacrifice. Cold. Um, well, I mean, if you're going to be a great general, you don't yep. go in safe. Mm -hmm. You do what has to be done. Exactly. Then, yep. Sengoku period. If they all could have just gotten around and had a nice chat and shaken hands, <laughs> everything wouldn't have been so damn different. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah. But every lord in their territory went bananas and killed mm -hmm. as many people as they had to. Yep. Hold equations. Um, yeah, uh, and so we, we, we move well, on. She yeah. was only. Uh, I, was, I was just gonna yeah. say she was only just following what other lords would do. Sure. With, with the Ashigaretsu, which is just basically they pick the farmers off the field and they say, "Here's a sharp, stabby thing, and we'll give you a colored hat so we know <laughs> that you're on our side." Now go out there and be stabby and let the samurai cut through you. I mean, it, yeah, it's yeah. just that's you know what they did. So she understood what you know. It, to her, it's it's you know like you're saying, it, it's a, as a general would go. Okay, yeah. these are my foot soldiers, and then I have yep. the real killers behind them. Mm -hmm. You know, isn't it so interesting to do to the see strategy? How, how feudal Japanese uh, use of foot soldiers is mirrored in the West as well. Where mm. you have your general lord or, or king march out night corps, and then you have your peasant foot soldiers who mm -hmm. all go off with pikes and other things and get their asses handed to them while the knights do the, you know, <laughs> dancing around and cutting people's heads off yeah. on horseback. You know, mm -hmm. like, oh, mm -hmm. kind of sucks to be a peasant. Sure it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um, and again, really more plot here. Um, as we head into the, the, the finale, um, when. 
um, we start to get, and hopefully we can see it here, um, when the apes show up. Yeah, so the apes show up as Lord Okoto is trying to, to run, and they're just apes at this point. Um, and they give a, a line, which I, I think is, in a sense, is a throwaway line. It's kind of a, um, a line that I think Miyazaki put in there just to kind of push the audience a little, where the apes go, something is coming, um, yeah, not, neither God nor human. Um, and you think, oh, God, what is this? Like, what is yeah. Miyazaki having to show for? <laughs> what new giant disaster is going to show up now? Yeah. Um, Gojira. No. <laughs> yeah, basically. That's what I was thinking. It's like, my God, goodness, you know. Kaiju. How much no. bigger can this get? Um, but it's basically just the men in the, um, uh, in the boar skins. Which Creepy. is going to bring a strategy from, from them. It's so quiet. You know, yeah. it's like, when you see it, it's, I thought... I thought it was like a full on like something super super supernatural Same here. was yeah. happening where it's just like, Oh god, they're not doing anything. They look like undead. I'm like, Oh mm. wow, what really this yeah. universe has it gotten worse <laughs> over all this and this is gonna be mm -hmm. super huge terrible. Like, yeah. Um one of the great things that that scene is you 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 don't know. Yeah. Um, um yeah, and then you know, the the tragic death of Lord Okoto, really. Um as he, he becomes consumed with rage. Um, and of course, the, the sad part is how it consumes San as well. And I, I think this is very interesting kind of philosophically, because um, what is Miyazaki saying here? I think what he's saying is that San allied herself with somebody who's going down a dark path. She was doing the, she was trying to do the right thing but she stayed with him beyond a point where she could help. Yeah. And as a result, she got dragged down with him. Right? Like, at some point, you have to let go. And she wasn't willing to do that, and that, that caused her to get dragged into this. Um, because this is... In a completely is... understandable kind of way. Absolutely. Right. Totally. She's right. looking at down the road. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, not that necessarily Moro is going to end up like this. Right. But, you know, as I said before, it's like the sunset of the gods is coming. Mm -hmm. And that includes her mother. You know what I mean? Right. So it's like Absolutely. She, she can't let him go. Oh, remember, you know earlier, I mean? remember earlier on when uh, Moro says, uh, you know, I have a bullet in my chest and so I'm going to die. And San looks at her just, no, no, this can't happen. You know, we got to go to the forest spirit. He'll take you back. Like that, that is a, a hard pass from San. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this, she can't, she is tangled up with it yeah. because she cannot let go because letting go means she accepts the inevitability. Right. And it's just like, oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to accept that inevitability either. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. Again, very human. Yeah. Um, and very natural, um, but also it has consequences. Yeah. Um, and boy, what a horrific moment this is. You know, if you thought the beginning was horrific with the tentacles everywhere, mm -hmm. seeing them take in San is just one level deeper into horror. Um, also, I have to say... Oh, good. No, I was going to... Uh, the body horror of it all. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. you know, when she sees Son in there, okay, so now you get a board, another, a second board that this, these things are coming out and they and mm -hmm. do it in lovingly grotesque yeah. detail of how they're coming, you know. Mm -hmm. You're just like, no, the not flesh. the eye, not the eye, not the eye, yep. you know, mm -hmm. right. And then it's it happens to Son, and you're like, oh, hell no. And right. then you go, oh, hell no again, because you see it coming out of her just like like the boar, and you're just mm -hmm. like, someone with a gun shoot her now. Yeah. Just, you know, just, you know, you just don't want that. And, mm -hmm. and you know, there's yeah. that whatever that, I don't know if it's actual physical pain or whatever, but there's trauma there. Yeah. Definitely going on, and it's just, just it's like you you see the the horror of of all this. And well, being consumed like, by lampreys uh, would probably yeah. freak me the hell out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it should also be pointed out, <laughs> not to get too specific, um, there are certain kinds of anime that involve certain things that look like this, and I do wonder if Miyazaki isn't kind of you know, again, implying, kind of, you know, using that imagery, kind of, everyone goes, oh, no, like, no, 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 no. Of course, Miyazaki doesn't, 
but right, right, like that—that that is a thing yeah. that had been around for a while. Um, so I think he—I I think he's kind of trading more on the horror of that, on the on the idea of that being just that visceral yeah. reaction. I'd like to go the horror part. I don't yeah, want to. Yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, I, 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 I agree. Yeah, yeah, doing that. Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that is kind of where, where he's. You know, that is some of the imagery. Um, it's Miyazaki's loving homage to that genre. No, yeah. no, it is not. Oh, no. Um, no. And so then we Miyazaki get... Miyazaki after dark. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so then Ashitaka confronts um, Lady Eboshi. And again, this is where I would argue that Lady Eboshi is doing exactly what Moro was doing earlier and, and asking uh, Ashitaka whether he is going to be an effective uh, husband for her daughter. Right, because she's basically doing the same thing. Are you going to live with that wolf girl? Right, um, she's challenging him. It should also be pointed out. This is something Okada pointed out. Um, Moro, looking at Ashitaka from the left. Lady Eboshi looking at Ashitaka from from the right. right. They're kind of. It's interesting this sort of positioning back and forth. He said, from from a cinematographic angle, it's pr it's pretty clear that these are being contrasted. Um, these two people are kind of saying the same thing. Um, uh, but of course it doesn't stop Eboshi. Um, and so then we move into our climax. And again, yeah, there's that, that body horror. Um, and so I, there, again, there's not too much to say here in terms of, of plot because it's kind of, all these consequences are all coming to a head, right? Everything now has to really go somewhere. Um, as Moro tries to save her daughter um, and pulls her out uh, at the last moment. Um, and we get um, Lady Boshi trying to kill the Great Forest Spirit. <sighs> Which she does. Um... And it's interesting seeing all the things going on here, where the Great Forest Spirit basically grants them their death. Um, it doesn't save them, it just says, no, it's time. Like, this needs to stop. And so we're just going to let this go. Um, because that is the best solution here, right? This is just continuing a cycle. And this is just stopping that cycle. Um, and then Eboshi kills the Great Forest Spirit. And I, again, that I love the Great Forest Spirit gives her that moment where it looks down at her and causes all of the flowers to sprout um, and to say, like, this is not what you want to do. Yeah. But Eboshi does it anyway. Um, yeah. Um, and then <laughs> things don't get better. No. Oof. You're like, okay, here's, here's, here's the revenge scene coming up. Oh, no, it's not. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. You've unleashed something far more horrible than you could ever have imagined. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Yikes. Um, it should also be noted how, like, half of the porters get killed instantly. Yep. Um, like, clearly, they do not know what they're dealing with here. Um, uh, and, of course, the Kodama start start dying um, as they have to get the head out. Um, also, I should point out um, we get, I, I always forget this guy's name, um, but Lady Boshi's right hand man. Yeah. Um, you know, all throughout the movie, he's been portrayed as kind of this goof. Um, and yet, like, when the chips are down, she's like, nope, you're gonna have to, like, navigate through all this stuff and tread on the, the, the bottom of the water and just hold your breath until you get there. And that's what he does. Yep. Um, and he just does what he needs to get needs to get done to, 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 to move there. Yeah, I love that one scene you flip by where yeah. he's like walking on the bottom you see the, you see the death bubbles like, going yeah. over, <laughs> over his head. He's just like... <laughs> 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 Gotta keep going! Yep! Oh. I, can, I can drown or just flat out die. Mm. Neither one's a good option. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> keep him moving. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and uh, you get this, this moment of... of and, and again... Very intimate moment here, um, in a real way. Um, um, as I try to figure out, figure out what to do. I also find this interesting. I don't know what this means. The fact that his neck splits around the moon 
in this shot. Um, because it is very clearly, like, he goes up, and then, like, his body never touches it. It just it keeps moving around the moon. Yeah. Obviously, it's not literally mm. the moon, but there seems to be some imagery there. I don't know what it is. Is there a Princess Kagura kind of it Could thing? be, could be. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, that would be the most famous tale, I would imagine, that would be impactful with the moon in it. It wouldn't yeah. necessarily be the... Usagi, rabbit on the moon, pounding right. mochi. That wouldn't really. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah it's I mean, strange. It was, Miyazaki had just, you know, a weird wild hair. It was like, ah, pff, let's just do the moon with the Princess Kagura. And wouldn't surprise me. Pounding mochi. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, given all the other things in here, wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, um, and so we get come back to Iron Town. Again, I love the pacing of this. Where we come back to Iron Town, we have this very quiet, sort of World War II movie moment of all the characters sitting around, kind of waiting for what's going to happen next. And again, it's this sort of quiet moment of, oh, whew, that's right, this is another thing that's happening, let's catch our breath, let's catch our breath a little bit, and then you realize what's about to happen. Um, as the great forest spirit's body starts pouring towards them, yeah. over that. Um, and again, this is where you realize that Lady Eboshi was completely wrong. Um, this was not going to work. Um, she could not just leave her people behind, Assume they would take care of everything. This was a failure. Um, As if, you know, killing a god was a great idea. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> and just saying. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Especially a, a nature god. Yeah. I mean, you know, it doesn't take a real rocket scientist to put that together and be like, kill a nature god, nature suffers. That's probably going to be not a good thing for everybody all around. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, and so they managed to make it out of Iron Town, and then very bad things happen. And this is the thing that, that again, sort of a, a geeky technology thing. I, I think most people don't, most viewers don't pay attention to. A forge's fires cannot go out. Right. 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 It's very hard to restart a forge. That is basically the death of the forge. Oh. Yeah. So, once that metal solidifies, heaven help you trying to get it going again. Exactly. Um, so that's what they're afraid of. And when this happens, this is it's basically the death of Iron Town. Oh. Yeah. Um, from a practical technological perspective. Um, uh, yeah, and so we get, you know, I will be honest here, a fairly straightforward action sequence ending. As beautifully rendered as it is, as amazingly done as it is, it's basically Ashitaka fights the monk and eventually gets the thing back. Um, um, and it's almost comedic, which is weird. Um, how Miyazaki makes this final scene, yeah. this almost goofy... You know, thing of really running after the the head and just rolling yeah. down the the, the, the thing, um, um, and the monk finally just says, "Okay, fine, take the head, whatever." Um, well, as some kind of mercenary, you figure that he's only got he's only getting as paid as much as he's getting paid to live at the end of it. He's not yeah. putting his life <laughs> on the line for this crap. Yeah, exactly. He's not paid enough to die for this. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and so he takes, uh, you know, they, they, they stand together. Um, Lepers that they are. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, this is, this is bad. Um, uh, San holding Ashitaka. And again, a very, very familiar sort of, sort of moment there. Um, uh, clearly feeling close. Um, and then this is what's interesting to me. Um, the god does get its head back in time. It works and yet he still falls over and I think it's a beautiful way for Miyazaki to showcase the themes of this is this is the death of this great forest spirit not of nature right right um, these processes still work all this is going on just this iteration broke basically um, and is going away um, and not only is going away, like, you know, we get the, the, the forest starts coming back almost immediately, right? Yeah. So there's clearly more supernatural things going on here. Um, well, it's you just, see the Kodama yeah. come back. Yes, the, the one Kodama I mean? it, at the end. So it's like, you, you, the thing's doing the thing, mm -hmm. you know? It's not yeah. just all done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So the question is, did the people learn anything from it? No. Right. They, yeah. And this feel that they don't, mm. actually. This is where I feel that they don't. Mm -hmm. And I and this is this is the point of contention that I actually have with this this movie mm -hmm. concerning the monk, the mercenary monk. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh, 
humble to get that moment to see that you know the, the landscape is going green and you know mm -hmm. what they had defiled and you know it's everything grows back and you look at the iron town and it's overcome with greenery and forges mm -hmm. kind of like just a, a structure for vines at this point and the lady says we will rebuild iron town mm -hmm. we will you know rebuild this and, da, 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 da. and i'm like going okay so you're you're just gonna do it all over again mm -hmm. You know, you're just yeah. gonna go back and you're gonna re try and recreate the forge, and you're just gonna keep mining. And this is your dream, and so you basically win, but you're minus an arm because yeah. you know, the other yeah. mother biting it off. Um, and then, so that kind of, I was just like, okay, the lesson was clearly not learned. Yeah. And then there was there's the monk, the mercenary monk who manages to survive at the end. Mm -hmm. And his whole thing is like, don't you realize that, you know, as he's going for the head, he's like, don't you realize that everyone dreams of having everything, and I'm actually <laughs> might actually be able to have this, and that's his yeah. motivation. Mm -hmm. And in any other movie, he would be dead. He would die yeah. a horrible death. Mm -hmm. Something negative would be there to teach him the lesson what he learns is that oh the next time i kill a god i better have a better plan because mm -hmm. he's just staying on the rock and he goes oh well and you're just like you killed all these sentient wars you you allowed people who have no business in being a war getting killed you're killing people off you're double crossing and you're killing people and you're and you're doing it with a smile yep friend. and and he gets away. He and, gets away with it. He gets away with it. And this is why I think, again, this yep. is sort of a transition period for Miyazaki, where this is not Castle in the Sky, right? Right. Um, this is a thing where, no, people are people. The bad guys sometimes get away in the end, you know? Um, this is life. <laughs> yeah. You know, hopefully Eboshi has learned to be more careful um, and to not be as stupid. Um, not that she was stupid, but you know, do not make the same mistakes again. Yeah. Right. Um, maybe not, right? Um, and in fact, when um, when those the workers' paradise must go on exactly. <laughs> um, when those uh, women writers and women folks working in Studio Ghibli complained about you know Ashitaka being this handsome ladies' man, um, one of the things he said is that for all we know, it, 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 you can certainly believe that Ashitaka actually did leave with San and went back to his village. Because there's no reason why he wouldn't do that. Help Iron Town rebuild for a while, and then go back with San to his village. And that's yeah. how they know, that's how they have that pottery that, that tells his story. Um, because this is not Iron, the story of Iron Town. It's the story of Ashitaka. Um, and how he found his path through. Right. Um, and found the right thing to do. Um, and then we end with that very nausea moment um, of the greenery... Uh, and then the, the, the shoot's coming up, and we do see the one lone Kodama who is there, who, according to Miyazaki, word of God, is Totoro. Well, When they were originally drawing this, the animator who was doing this scene pleaded with Miyazaki, because originally the Kodama was not there. She said, this is way too sad of an ending. Yeah. Please let me draw Kodama just showing up there. And Miyazaki surprisingly said yes. Um, and so she drew it in. And when he said it, he, when he, he saw it, he said, that's great. That's so great. That's Totoro. I'm telling you that's Totoro. Because when he made Totoro, he had all this backstory as to why Totoro existed. And his whole backstory was about this war between the gods that killed off all the gods. And Totoro was one of the last gods that left which is why he's the only one who exists, who's in this, this, this spot. Um, and all of that backstory eventually turned into Princess Mononoke. Wow. So um, one of the reasons I think why you see, you know, the Kodamas leading in this very Totoro-like way, you see this Kodama at the end, is because this is Totoro. This is, that being would eventually, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years later, evolve into the Totoro that we know because it survived this massive war. Because yeah, I was hoping all like the that. new all the new growth was that since the Kodama are, are 
mm. connected to the trees that are connected mm -hmm. to nature. I thought that as being a, a, a not lone survivor, but being the rebirth of not only, you know, all these new shoots coming out of the ground, the Kodama is a new Kodama that is coming mm. up with the growth. So mm. I was I was hoping right. it was much more hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, dig, so I didn't I want dig it to be the like the color. last Kodama who's looking around going, ah, I'm alone. <laughs> like, oh, so sad. Yeah. Hard to say. It, this is the other thing. Is it again, Miyazaki's kind of like, well. Who else can hear me go? Oh, sorry, Steve, you cut out for a second. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, this is the thing: is that there are multiple interpretations of this film, right? There's lots of different ways you can go with this film. I think those are right. they're, they're very valid. So yeah, that is Princess Mononoke. Okay. Um, um, obviously, a lot to unpack in the film. Um, a very complex movie. As folks are saying in the chat, not a movie you like watch once and understand everything about. Um, definitely deserves multiple viewings. Yeah, um, there's a lot there. I'm sure there's plenty that we haven't even touched on. Exactly. No question. Oh, yeah. Yikes. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Um, anything else you guys wanted to, to uh, mention before we move on to the next thing? Um, was it... <clears throat> so I was, and I was amazed to see that the author of American Gods wrote the, uh, the song that the women wrote, uh, that were singing in, in, the, uh, in Iron Town. Neil Gaiman's one of the um, uh, screenwriters. He, he, wrote, he's, he adapted yeah. this to English. Oh, okay. uh, in yeah. fact, famously... Well, he's the one who adapted it. Yeah. Um, obviously, there are multiple people involved, but he, he did the, the, the main first pass. Uh, in fact, the line early on when Jigo is in the village and he goes, um, um, is this soup or donkey piss? Um, what? Well... Yeah, that, that, that's his first line. Yeah, is it, he, yeah, he's sitting he there said, and he, he said just said looks up and yeah. goes, is this, you're serving super donkey piss. Um, that's actually an interesting translation because the original line is, this tastes like water. Yeah, I was going to say that well, the Japanese yeah. one didn't, didn't come across <laughs> that. And that's the way. thing. In, Jap in Japan and Japanese at the time, that's a major insult. To imply that your soup tastes like water. It means so, it tastes like nothing. Right, it means it tastes like nothing. Um, so when Gaiman saw that line, he was like, that, that doesn't register to, Eng to Americans the same way, to English speakers the same way. So he translated it in a way that gets across the spirit of the line in a different way. And, 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 and to be clear, like... That certainly gets the idea across. Yep. Um, and, you know, yeah. that, that passed through Ghibli. Like, they, they understood that and they approved that. Um, because, again, things... Different cultures are different. <laughs> and you've got to yeah. get across things differently. <laughs> Um, yeah, Neil, uh, Gaiman was involved. Um, uh, check out the, the dub cast of this just for some interesting things. It's, it's kind of neat seeing who was involved yeah. um, because um, um, I'm trying to remember um, the like uh, whole Claire thing. Um, do, 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 do. Where do they say that in the thing? Um, they do not. Thank you, Wikipedia. I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, mm, it's probably up there somewhere, just kind of... Uh, there we go. Um, uh, yeah, Ashaka is Billy Crudup. Um, San is Claire Danes. Um, Claire Date. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Claire Danes. Um, um, what's wow. her name? Oh, gosh. Irish actress. Mm. Oh, she appeared uh, across from mm. uh, Matt Damon. Um, I don't know. She was in Gross Point Blank. And I'm blanking on her name, but yeah. anyway, she she um, she was one of the one of the side. There's a lot of interesting people. In this oh yeah, um, Mini Driver is Lady Boshi. Mini Driver. Um, Mini Driver. That's what I'm thinking yeah. of. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, Gillian Anderson plays Moro, um, mm -hmm. who's an inspired uh, choice. Wow. Um, does a great job, and she she was a longtime Miyazaki fan when this opportunity came around. It's hilarious watching her in the documentaries going. So I got to play in a Miyazaki movie. Like, this was a dream come true. <laughs> wow. This is one of those things where, you know, I, I heard this was an opportunity. I was like, oh, please, wait, please. Um, she wow. really, really loved that. Um, yeah, and some other, um, yeah, Tar Strong plays Kaya. Um, Jada Pinkett, Jada Pinkett is in it. Mm -hmm. She does uh, Tiko, Tika, the, the guy with the broken zone's wife. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and 
Um, Bender is also in the movie. Yes. Uh, John DiMaggio plays Gonza. Yeah. That's that's Bender. Nice. Yeah. That's Bender. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so um, a lot of fun stuff. Anyway, that is for this one. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break, and I'll be back in a few minutes to talk about anime news and such. So we will see you in a little bit. <laughs> 